spoken unto you that in me I have peace. world you will have tribulation cheer cheer good cheer
That was really good and sweet, good and sweet. Let me leave that. Yeah, no, here you go. Just leave it on red and just turn it on when you're going to talk. So Mark's going to have a microphone, and um, if you want to say something, please wait till the microphone gets there. Just kind of raise your hand, and uh, that way the people at home can hear. I know we have a few members that don't like to drive at night, which I understand because it's pretty much night already. <laughs> um, everybody remember where we were at in our study? Jeremiah chapter 1, just kind of getting started. So let me ask you, does anybody, does everybody know who Martin Luther is? Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. Uh, does anybody not know who Martin Luther is? So, so Martin Luther uh, was a Catholic. And in the 1500s, when he was a Catholic, and anybody that anybody that jo- that wants to be a that join the church as far as, as far as wanting to just kind of pursue a life career, you would join the monastery. You'd be part of the group, and they would school you and teach you and uh, train you up in the ways of um, the priesthood. But in the process of that, you learn all about the church. You learn about it, the system, the process. Matter of fact, I heard being. Um, the guy that's the commentator, the Jewish guy, uh, smart guy. But anyways, I, he's a Jewish, and I heard him mention about Judaism. They don't convert people. Um, but you could go to heaven if you follow the laws of Noah, he said. And uh, I just thought that was just strange for him to say that and to just kind of make God seem like you're not allowed to come to him, basically. Uh, well, Martin Luther, when he was, when he was part of the, the Catholic Church, he understood some things about how uh, salvation worked from the understanding of the church. And does anybody know what indulgences are? An indulgence is a price you pay to get something spiritual from the church. And so you can basically, matter of fact, when, you, when, when Catholics would go to the, to the church to light a candle and they put some money and light the candle, what they're doing is they're praying for their loved ones in purgatory. Well, according to Martin Luther and the church at the time, the the Pope had the power to grant indulgences, to grant your loved one time off in hell, in in purgatory. Of course, we don't necessarily believe in purgatory, but they they, they believed that Christ is... Martin Luther said that everybody, because of their sin, owes something from themselves. We already know that we have blood of Christ covering our sins, but Martin Luther and some of them also believed that there was something you had to pay, and that's kind of where purgatory comes into play. Well, his argument, one of his arguments were that if the Pope had the power to release people from purgatory, why is he charging everybody to do it? Why is he charging people to get out of purgatory early if he had the power? Why is he taking a poor man's money, who is, instead of him helping his neighbor, he says, I'm not going to help my neighbor. I want to get my loved one out of, pur- out of hell, out of purgatory sooner. So they take the money and give it to the church. His biggest problem was that they were building St. Peter's Cathedral. And when they were building St. Peter's Cathedral, they were using indulgences as a way to finance that. And, and Martin Luther was very upset. So he wrote all these different reasons. But the reason I'm even bringing him up is because Martin Luther did exactly what the Lord is telling Jeremiah to do during his day. Jeremiah is going to go to the priests, he's going to go to the church, he's going to go to the temple, and he's going to go to the people, and he's going to call the people out on all their false worship, he's going to call them out on all their false ideas, he's going to call them all out on their adulteries and their sins, on what they're doing. I believe that if Jeremiah were to show up today, he could come into this church and call a bunch of us out. It's unfortunate that we've allowed ourselves to almost be conditioned to be worldly Christians, but that's part of, I think, what God wants to get out of us. And I think that God's love and patience going forward is wanting to get that out of us. And so Martin Luther uh, said some things that I, I just wanted to read because I thought that His heart for the Lord is where our heart for the Lord needs to be. Because listen, 
There are 15,000 different Christian denominations. Think about that. Christian denominations. Not just religions. Ones that center on the cross or that say they center on the cross. You know, that would include Jehovah's Witnesses and those that, that, that we know aren't Christian, but, but they, they, they claim that as their religion. But the Lord's coming back for one church, for one pure bride, and each of us are going to stand alone before him with Christ. If Christ is your Savior, he'll, he'll be there with you. But each one of us are going to be there apart from other people. And the only merit that you'll have on that day is Jesus Christ. He's the only merit. And the church over the years has brought in other things so that it can profit off of it. I just wanted to read a little bit of what he said. And, and because what God is calling Jeremiah to do is have a boldness. But it's got to be a God-led, spirit-filled boldness or you're just doing it in the flesh. And you do not want to attack the enemy in the flesh. See what I'm saying? You don't want to attack the enemy without praying, without asking the Lord to go before you, and without knowing that he's leading you to do that. He says, the revenues of all Christendom are being sucked into this insatiable basilica. The Germans laugh at calling this common treasure of Christendom. Before long, all the churches, palaces, walls, and bridges of Rome will be built out of our money. First of all, we, sh we should rear living temples next, next local churches, and only last of all, St. Peter's, which is not necessary for us. We Germans cannot attend St. Peter's. Better that it should never be built than, than that our parochial churches should be despoiled. And so what he's saying is, he's saying, you're spending so much money and effort over here to build something fabulous, and you're letting these souls just go off and die and not, ha and not have no resources to help them. Listen, we have a food pantry. The food pantry is not just for people struggling outside those doors. The food pantry is available to you if one month or one week you need some some help just getting through the week and you could use, save $100 or $200, this is the place to do it. This is your church. These are your resources. We share with those that are on the outside, but they're here for us. That's why God brought them to us. And he says, why doesn't the Pope build the Basilica of St. Peter's out of his own money? He is richer than Croesus, whoever that was. He would... He would do better to sell St. Peter's and give the money to the poor folk who are being fleeced by the hawkers of indulgences. Now, this is Martin Luther in the 1500s. And in the 1500s, they didn't treat anti-Catholics very well. That's around the Dark Ages. And we know the people that they checked. Uh, Tyndale, the guy that gave us the modern English version of the Bible, he was hunted down by the soldiers of the Catholic Church and, and killed and murdered for just wanting to share the gospel to people that could read the English language. Ain't that something? So then he says, Popple indulgences, this is, where he, this is where it matters to him the most, is salvation issue. And this is what matters to the Lord most of anything. People can sell, you know, that God will bless you and give you and, and provide for you and give you more than you can handle. He, he will do those things, but Christianity is not about that. That's the last thing Christianity is about, is what you get from it. It's the only thing that you truly get from it is forgiveness and redemption and eternal life. That's all you can really expect from the Lord. Papal indulgences do not remove guilt. Beware of those who say that indulgences affect reconciliation with God. He who, listen to what he says. He who is contrite has plenary remission of guilt and penalty without indulgences. Remember when the Lord says a, a broken spirit and a contrite heart the Lord loves? He's referring back to that one passage that, that reflects the kind of people that God receives. Not somebody that pays off somebody to get somewhere. And that's very unfortunate because, listen, many of us, or Bible dummies. I was a Bible dummy. 
when I first got saved. I didn't know anything. So if you told me something, I believed it. If you told me it was in the Bible, I would just take it and, and believe you were telling me the truth. And so a lot of things that I was told at the very beginning, I believed. And then it took me a while to kind of walk this thing out and figure it out and just kind of, you know, have an understanding of how Christianity was going to work. So he says, talks about it, coming to the Lord with a contrite heart. He said, the Pope can only remove those penalties, listen to what he says, which he himself has imposed on earth. For Christ did not say whatsoever I, I have bound in heaven you may loose on earth. Therefore, I claim that the Pope has no jurisdiction over purgatory. If the Pope does have power to release anyone from purgatory, now he believes in purgatory, Martin Luther does. If the Pope does have power to release anyone from purgatory, why in the name of love does he not abolish purgatory by letting everyone out? If for the sake of miserable money he, is, he released uncounted souls, why should he not for the sake of most holy love empty the place? To say that souls are liberated from purgatory is audacious. To say they are released as soon as the coffer rings is, is to incite avarice, which means pay some homage. The Pope would do better to give everything away without charge. And this is the last thing he said. Indulgences are positively harmful to the recipient because they impede salvation by diverting charity and inducing a false sense of security. He's saying that by giving to the church, you're thinking you're really helping God out when you're supposed to be helping your poor brother out. The, the Lord told us that we were going to have the poor on the earth, that there were going to be those that needed help from us. Now, we don't, we don't, when we go to Mexico and all the kids run up to you and the missionaries always says, don't give them money because you're training beggars. We're not here to train beggars. We're here to lift up people out of darkness and help them walk in a new way of thinking. And, and, and a guy that comes up here and says, man, I walk five miles to work every day, you know, I, you can give me a bus ticket, I'm going to buy him a lot of bus tickets because he's putting in the work. Especially even if they don't go to church here, we'll help people out. But our job is to watch out for each other more than make, think that we can buy our way into Christ's love anymore. He says, uh, he who spends money on indulgences instead of relieving want receives not the indulgence of the Pope, but the indignation of God. He said, instead of loving your brother, you're more worried about pleasing the Pope. He said, you're more into get indignation from God than anything. Indulgences are the most per per pernicious because they include complacency and thereby imperil salvation, which means you think you just bought it, you're good. And then let me ask you this. How many, we all have Catholic loved ones, you know what I mean, that in their mind and in their heart, I'm Catholic, I'm good, I did, I did what they asked me to do, I've done it, and I'm good. I will tell you this, that I believe that our prayers for those, God's not going to unhear or not hear. And so I trust the Lord with our loved ones. Uh, indulgences are the most, let me read this again, pernicious because they include complacency and thereby imperil salvation. Those persons are damned who think that letters of indulgence Make them certain of salvation. God works by contraries so that man feels himself to be lost in the very moment when he is at the point of being saved. So he's saying that we get to the point of being saved when we feel like we're at our most desperate place, where we, where we know we need more than what's been given to us in this life. That's why a lot of you come to church. You, you, life has left you dry. Relationships have left you dry. The, the American dream has left you dry, and you're looking for something to to feel that dryness. And then when you break down, you come to the Lord, you can kind of feel it. But if I'm pointing you to an indulgence, I'm pointing you to a class, and I'm pointing you to, you know, um, oh, you got to run up there and get baptized right now. You know, and, and trying to, you got to speak in tongues or you don't, you're not filled with the Spirit. And you start throwing these things on people, it, 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 they lose sight. It's very easy to get saved. Man gets in the way and complicates it. That's why we don't do... Um, Classes on how to be a Calvary Chapel people? We, we don't do classes like that. We, we, we study the Bible together, and we learn together. It says, uh, 
Man must first cry out that there is no health in him. He must be consumed with horror. This is the pain of purgatory. In, the disturbance, in this disturbance, salvation begins. When man believes himself to be utterly lost, light breaks. Peace comes in the word of Christ through faith. That's the most powerful thing Martin Luther said and understood about salvation. After he got this big old book from the Catholic Church on how to be a good Catholic, it took this book to contradict that book and start a whole revolution of churches. The whole Protestant movement started after that. So many of us were finally given the Bible ourselves so that we could look and see not what he's telling me it says, but what it says for itself. And that's the, that's the privilege we have to be in the century we're at. Not only that, but we have, all, we have, we have, we have dummy versions of this. You, you can get it in almost any language. Any language. So, let me ask you something. How do you know when the Lord's speaking to you to do something? Is it an impression? Do you just get an impression? Do you have a dream? Um, do you never hear the Lord ever speak to you? Let me ask you, how many of you here have felt the Lord speak to them? How many of you have had a hard time hearing the Lord speak to you? Not to be embarrassed. So let me ask you this. Have you ever read the Bible and ever felt like uh, it was speaking to you? See, that's him speaking to you. <laughs> See, that's how he speaks to you. It's when you read it and you know, look, and you know that the true author wasn't Peter, that the true author wasn't King David, the true author wasn't Moses, the true author wasn't Paul, the true author was the Holy Spirit. And when you kind of at least get your heart wrapped around the idea that it's the Lord speaking this, then you're not all messed up by which man is saying it. Because some of these things are going to be very difficult going forward. Even some of our conversations, I can already tell in the weeks to come, as judgment starts coming down, some of the conversations that I think we're going to have, it's going to be very, very opening for all of us to hear what other people are thinking. We don't want to hear everything you're thinking. We just want to hear certain things that apply to where we're at. So let me ask you this. Has the Lord ever asked any of you to do something that you did not want to do and you did it anyways and you knew the Lord was in it? Right, well, give, bring the microphone over here, Mark. Turn it on. Speak in the microphone. Okay, so I was at church and I saw one of my friend's um, boyfriends up at the altar and he's very abusive they're not she is not in that relationship anymore thank god and god put it on my heart to go pray for him and at first i was like what you want me to go pray for that jack but but i did because no matter what you got to be obedient to god that's good that's good that's that's the kind of stuff that, yes ma'am right here get it right here mark no we, you don't need it but kathy lagrasso does and, and Dot, Dot's watching. They want to hear you, so put the microphone here. Put the microphone. Put the microphone up. Lesson last Sunday. Like a dummy? <laughs> we, we all do. We all do. You know, does anybody else have one where the, the Lord spoke to them? Mark? Yeah, so, I don't know, maybe eight, 29 years ago, 
this rings true to me because uh, the Lord, Lord spoke to me and said, you need to go to the jail. I did not want to go to the jail. For years, I prayed for a flat tire on the way to the jail. I did not want to go, but he proved himself each and every time that what a blessing it was having gone to the jail talk to the guys and just share Christ with them. It's like, man, I was walking off the ground when I left, and I, I'd be thinking to myself, why did you struggle with that? But then the next week came around, and I'd be going, uh-uh, no, Lord, no, as I'm driving there. And yet he's faithful. Yeah. And now I can't wait to Blessing it is. Yeah. Go ahead, Robin. Let Robin say something. A couple of weeks ago at prison on Tuesday night, I was very impressed to pray for one of the ladies whose prayer request was just a lot of stress uh, in her spirit. So I walked up to her and I was praying and talking to her and uh, impressed on my heart to tell her what the Holy Spirit put on my heart during. The teaching, Mark was teaching, and everything he said backed up everything I said to her. And when she was walking out that night, she was three feet off the ground. Wow. It was wow. not me, that's for yeah, sure. That's good. You know, when, when, uh, when I was in Port Aransas, um, before I went, I always told the Lord that I knew that uh, I was called to, to be a preacher. I just, I didn't know what what that would look like, but I, would, I just knew I was called, and uh, when I got asked to go pastor a church in Port Aransas, I, I, I just said, yes, I'd go, and then, but moving back, um, things had started changing financially for us, and so I went to my wife, and I said, you know, I, I, I had several guys come to visit me from Waco and hung out with me for a few days, encouraged me, and I just go, you know, I think I'm supposed to move back to Waco. I just felt that impression, and uh, so I went to my wife, and I said, babe, I think they think the Lord, we've only been there a year and a half, not even two years. I said, I think the Lord wants us to go back to Waco. And um, she, said, she said, I trust you. Just, I just want you to make sure it's the Lord telling us to move back. And I said, okay. So I prayed about it some more, and it just seemed like it was the right thing to do. So we started making plans. We moved back. We started a Bible study in our backyard, and it was called Freedom of Life Church. And it was just a few of us. My parents were there. Um, but Mark was friends with one of the ladies sons that was coming to the Bible study who's part of my family now, and uh, I'd already known Mark from, from visiting California with David, and Mark came to our Bible study, and, uh, and I'd already been a fan of Calvary Chapel already and since I got saved. I, was, I just followed them, I followed their teaching. In my wildest dreams, I never thought Calvary Chapel would be in my history, be in my part of who I am, and, and yet Mark showed up, California met Carol, <laughs> moved down here, gave me tapes and magazines. I think the first time he came, all these Chuck Smith tapes and things, and I read in one of the articles that said, if you want to be a Calvary Chapel, here's what you do. And, um, man, it just made sense that God, that was God. And so I've learned over the years that God's voice isn't always audible, and it's not even always an impression that you know it's his impression. But, listen, you will always sense him because he's going to have you do things that, always, that not always make sense, that's not always comfortable, and that's not always a free ride. He just doesn't do that. He doesn't make it that easy for us. He makes us go get him. He makes us go get him to move us, you know, and, and, but, but as you're open to, to, to the scriptures and as you're open to, to the and asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, he's going to impress some things on you. I was in a church. <clears throat> a lady was sitting right here in the front row in another church. Another was behind her. This lady is sitting here with $20 in her pocket. A missionary's there, and she feels, and I, I was there. I was watching. And then she told me, I could tell something was going on when she was praying, and she said, told me later that it felt like the Lord was telling her to give that missionary $20. Well, she said that $20 was her son's lunch for the week. 
And she said, the Lord would not ask me to give my son's lunch money away to this missionary. But it just, it was just wearing her out. And you, you know, some of you know this stuff. Some of you learned to reject that. She didn't reject it, thank God. She gave that $20. Well, at the same time, this lady was being moved in the spirit to give this lady $100. Not the missionary, but the woman. The woman was crying. I remember she cried because she wanted to make sure she wasn't just giving her $20 away for nothing. <clears throat> and so the Lord moved on her. She did it. And then that lady came to her. And then I heard the testimony afterwards. And I just go, That's, my God is a beautiful, beautiful God. Let's read in Jeremiah where we, where we left off last week. I'm going to back up a little bit. And, um, well, you know, let's just read the whole chapter. We got time. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Now, remember, Josiah was the best king Israel, Judah had. And, um, and from the time of Jeremiah and Josiah, it's only going to be 40 years before they're taken into captivity. It said, it came in the days, also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, he's between 17 and 22 years old, they believe. Before you were born, I sanctified you. So the, so the Lord already had a precognizant thought and saw him before he was created. That's powerful. That lets you know his eyes are on you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, which means I had a purpose for you before you were born. That's another positive thing that all of us can think about, but many times we reject that idea that God has a plan for us because we've, we've made a, a joke of our lives at some points maybe. And, and maybe mess some things up. But at no point in your life until you're dead, you're done. As long as there's a heartbeat, God is not finished. And as Brad's talking to me today, he will redeem the time. As God does so well. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now he's telling you, a young kid, that you're going to be speaking to these, these nations. Then I said, this is what most of you would say when the, Lord, when the Lord told you to go pray for that guy. You said, when the Lord said, go pray, you go, but Lord, I can't go pray for him. He's a jerk. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. Do not say that I'm a young Christian. Do not say that I don't know the, enough of the word. Don't say that I haven't been a Christian long enough. Don't say, don't say, don't say these excuses. Don't say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. That's very important to know that the people you, God sends you to, he sent you there. That you end up in front of, he put you there. Unless you're in sin and you're doing things you ought not do, then you're going to be in front of people you shouldn't be around. And you might even end up in a court you didn't plan on being in. But at some point, if you're a Christian, God will catch up to you. Whether it's in Mountain View Prison, McLean County Jail, or wherever in the hospital, he will find you. Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Because what we're going to tell them and what they're, what they're going to hear is going to make them mad, just like today. You tell a sinner they're sinning, they're mad, they're not happy with you. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set this, I, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now, he's using, in the original language, it's very technical words here. These aren't just phrases that just sound, oh, okay, that's just an analogy. He's, he's using technical terms because what the Lord's going to do, he's going to bring it to nothing. He's going to bring his nation to nothing. Before he can bring it back up and let it rise from the ashes, he's got to break it down because of its sin. He's got to purge it. He says, um, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I see a branch 
of an olive tree, almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Did you read that with me? What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree. And then he says, good. And then the Lord says, uh, wait a minute. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. The, the, the original language, when I read that, I went, you know what? I need to really go look that up and see why is that so important, why he said almond tree. And so an almond tree in Israel is the first tree to bud. It usually buds in January rather than towards the spring. And so if you go in the spring, the tree already has full of nuts. And, uh, and it also, there's two words that is used here, and, um, which means the Lord's ready, just like an almond tree. When it buds, it's ready to start doing what it's called to do, and that's make almonds. But the Lord is saying it's time for me to move in action, and he's about to start. And it also means to watch over. And so not only is he going to bring this judgment, but he's going to watch over this judgment. He's going to be a participant, in, 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 and he's going to take a very parental interest, a, a very fatherly interest in what he has to do to his children, just like any parent that has to discipline their child. It's not easy to discipline your child. You know, the first time, you spank him a little bit or you punish him a little bit. But what if they don't listen? Then what do you do? How far do you go? Well, the Lord says as, as they've gone on that he's going to have to just do away with them. Let the enemy come and take them away and, and not necessarily kill them, but take them into captivity. Matter of fact, they want to worship these gods. They're going to go over there and get all the gods they want in Babylon. And they're going to want out of it. They're going to never want another god again. And then he says, then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm ready to perform my word. And the Lord said to me a second time, saying, what do you see? And I, I said, I see a boiling pot. And it is facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. Calamity. That's a powerful word. That's a word of destruction. And, uh, and that, that boiling pot is what they would take those boiling pots and dump them over the, the wall when there would be an army coming filled with oil and things like that, a seething pot. And so the Lord has said he's ready to bring his, his fire judgment on uh, his nation. In Matthew chapter 10, from, from where Jeremiah is at to where we're at, uh, to, to Jesus' days, about 500 years. And so f about 500 years after Jeremiah, Jesus is born, and the New Testament begins. And when the New Testament comes, we know, because we've, we've studied the book of Romans before, some of you know, that um, salvation first came to the Jews, right? But they rejected it overall. There's a lot to believe in Jews, but overall the nation has rejected Jesus. And Paul, Paul knew that what's happening to them today would happen to them. But even though the Lord is going to bring this calamity on them, he didn't utterly destroy them because Jerusalem's still there today. They're having to fight for their lives, but they're there fighting for something. The Lord may take you down to nothing. The, the Lord may take some of your loved ones down to nothing just to rebuild them. He may allow them to continue to make the choices they're making and go down the path they go so that he can ultimately break them and crush them to a point where he can remake them. He doesn't, he doesn't rebuild us. He remakes us. We're, 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 we're born-again believers. And as a born-again believer, if you stray and you go backwards, then there's, there's, there's more heavy consequences for you than the world. That's why sometimes you see people like, Hugh Hefner, who's the king of pornography, basically, live a full life. And then you see some young people over here struggling with drugs, drugs dying at 20 and 30, senseless. They're not smart enough to know better and just dying like that. How, how does that make any sense? We, we just only have the ability to trust the Lord with that kind of stuff. But even back in, the Lord, the Lord is saying some things. He sends out the 12 to go and, and be a, 
image bearer of Christ, basically. These 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God's all, always concerned about the Jewish people. And, and it's very important not to get caught up in some of the rhetoric that you're hearing on the news and some of your loved ones are probably caught up in and friends are talking about. It doesn't matter it, to us as Christians. I mean, it matters to the heart, but it doesn't matter where my devotion is. If, if, if God told me to bless and love the Jewish people, that's what I'm going to do. Just like if my son was a murderer, I'd still love him, right? We, we, we've, we've been going through the books of the kings, man, reading bad king after bad king after bad king. We're thinking, Lord, be done with them. Choose the Mexicans. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Give us a shot. Listen, that's not how it works, and that's not his plan. His plan was to, sh even, even, even with all the negative things happening to the Jewish people, it's still a lesson for us, a lesson for our own personal walk. Look, I don't want to be Israel's judge. The Lord is their judge. I'm, 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 I'm the healing hands, whether it's a Palestinian or a Jewish person. I'm going to help whoever's on the ground in front of me. I'm not going to be like the Good Samaritan. I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm just going to do the right thing. Because when the Lord gave that particular parable, that's all that was about. Just doing the right thing with the right heart. That's how Christianity really walks itself out. Now, you can't get to heaven by just being good. But getting saved produces a heart of a Samaritan. Supposed to. So we as Christians don't have a right to, to judge these people. That's God's job. He says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, which means I'm going to supply your needs as you go. And then he says this, now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will, will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for than that city. These are God's cities he's talking about the judgment on. He says Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be judged a little bit. How do you do that? How does that work? How does the levels of judgment work? Sodom and Gomorrah is no longer here. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no more Sodomites or Gomorrahites, only in, you know, character now. We, we, we're called to be holy. And that's a very hard calling. In America, with, with, with especially with social media now, with TV and things, with everything, it's very difficult to have pureness that the way I'm sure the Lord wants us to have it. The ne very next chapter, he goes on and says, he, be he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Corazon, war to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sodom, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So there's a judgment coming on this world. So let me ask you, um, how comfortable are you confronting anybody with truth? You know, um, you're not comfortable. You, you, you know, has anybody ever, has anybody ever um, like we talked about Jehovah's Witnesses last week, and some of you talked about inviting them in your homes and having conversations with them. Um, has, has any of your, like, has any of your friends uh, converted to, a, to like Jehovah's Witness or, or a Seventh-day Adventist or... Yeah, right. I know. I'm about to get you some better shoes. Family is the hardest people to And uh, 
learned something just the other day, and, and I, I really like it. It's easier when you have your window clean and your cup full of God's word, and the the window being clean is a light that shines in you, and the light will shine back at you. Okay, well, preaching to a Catholic is hard in my family, and. You can pray for them, and God puts people in front of you, and you have to say something. You have to try to keep them from going to where you know they're going. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, that's another thing. You know, can you can you witness to your family? Do you have a hard time witnessing to your family? Do you it's have a hard, hard time witnessing to, you know, your best friends? You know, it can and be I hard. I want to add one little thing, and what was hard for me Money's always hard for anybody, but I've I've learned that when you uh, if you give something a, a good amount of money to somebody and you expect it back, and even though you didn't tell them you wanted it back, and you kind of wait for them, well the guy's doing good, he ought to jump on in here and give me some. But the Lord is the one that gives it back ten times fold, and I've learned that saying right there exactly and I just thought I'd throw it out there because to me money is hard for a lot of people it, and definitely I was one of the worst <laughs> so, so has anybody ever tried to witness to a family member and got in trouble or they got mad at you yes you have I've um, had physical confrontations with my brother I mean bad when I was first saved, and I'd tell him, you know, I told him, well, you guys are all going to hell, you know. But um, we would, we would, you know, yeah. over it. It was, it was bad. You know, like when I got saved, I wanted to tell everybody. And, and, and I did tell everybody. I even, I told my mom and dad. My dad was one of those Catholics. He didn't want to hear it. You know, he just, he, this is the way we are. This is the way we've been this way forever. You know, but, but, but let's look at some things. Let's just see. You know, for yourself, and and when you see for yourself, you'll you'll see if the Lord is working. If the Lord's the one doing the drawing, it's He's gonna do His thing. You know, but we don't know who He's working on. We don't know whose heart He's knocking on. But so we knock on as many hearts as we can to see if the Lord is in that heart or in that heart. And so you know, one of the, one of the things that I was hoping to do years ago, I I, I gave opportunities for people to ask questions about religious things, Bible things things they, they might be embarrassed to ask out loud, put it in the offering box, and the next week I answered them as best I could. But I thought that, you know, and I know some of you probably won't ever say anything, uh, but I will tell you this, that, it, that, that, that we're called to be image bearers of Christ. And as an image bearer of Christ, this life is not ours to do what we want to do with it completely. In our walk with our Christianity, God has been patient enough with us as Americans to give us grace, way more grace than I think we deserve. Now, as a pastor, looking back, I just go, Lord, how, how did we get to where we're at? And so I want to make sure that we're going back to where we're supposed to be at, walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit, like the early church, you know, to be like a tribe. That, that watches out for each other, that we see who's here, we watch out. You know, do you need something? Because some people just stop going to church for, for other reasons, but some people stop going to church because they can't get there. Something else is going on. They just need somebody to reach out to them. And so we have to be available. Even when you're in HEB, just be, just be aware. Just sometimes just a kind word, just a, just a, just a sweet, hey, your kid's a beautiful child, just anything. And then carry a church card with you. And just, hey, if you're ever looking for a church, if you don't go to church anywhere, if you're ever just looking, just hand a church card out. You don't have to tell them that I'm the best pastor in the world because I'm not. You don't tell them I'm the best preacher in the world because I'm not. But you can tell them we have some of the best people in church because we do. We absolutely we do. And, and, and who we are as a church is way better than who I am as a pastor and who I am as a teacher. And, and, I, and I, I thrive on that, and I, and, I, and I know that that's where most of my encouragement comes from, is the love that you're giving to each other. And, and so I'm, I'm equipped to confront. I'm equipped to do that, but so are you. 
especially in these last days, somehow, some way, your light can shine and you can be salty. Salt and the light. That's who we're called to be. Jeremiah, as we get into chapter 2, as we move through the rest of chapter 1 and get into chapter 2, you know, there's some very difficult things for him to have to say to, to, to these people. But it needs to be said. The, our God says those things. And if he says those things, then we don't just go, uh, well, God's grace. God's grace. I mean, his grace is, is wonderful, but his judgment is just as real as his grace. And, and we, we can see it. And he's telling them, the day of judgment. It's going to be better on the day of judgment. There's a day of judgment coming on the world. So let's just pray and just ask the Lord to just, you know, to, be, to begin to just pull our hearts together, to pull our spirits more in line with his spirit. And uh, let's just see how this thing walks out because there are some radical changes coming. And I want us to be ready. And if I, if I have anything to do with it as a leader, I'm going to do my part. So let's pray. And pray for me so I can do my part. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for your spirit, Lord. I thank you for your guidance. I thank you for your word that, that can guide us and, and, and keep us in our lane, Lord. And so, Father, I pray as we go forward in these studies and these teachings, Lord, that you will begin to help equip us to be better voices, to be better uh, lights to this world around us, Lord. There's so many people here that are complacent in this city around us. So many lives are just complacent to the spiritual realm, to eternity, Lord. And Father, eternity is so, so coming. It's on its way for all of us. And so, Father, put us in positions to, to, to be a light to others, Lord God, guiding them to you as you draw them to yourself, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.